Hello and welcome to Comic Culture. I'm Terrence Stollard, a professor in the Department of Mass Communication at the University of North Carolina at Pembroke. My guest today is artist and anchor Scott Hanna. Scott, welcome to Comic Culture. Hello and thank you for having me on. So, Scott, every time I have an anchor on the show, I like to ask this question because a lot of people aren't sure what an anchor does and there's a really, there's a lot that goes on uh, behind uh, the brush. So, can you tell us what an anchor does? Um, it is a difficult question for the layman to understand. Uh, because comics started out as a monthly product that they needed to get out a certain amount of work every month, uh, comics uh, took on the animation model of having a collaboration of artists and different people doing different parts. In animation, they would have one person doing the rough drawings, another person doing the inking, um, uh, the outlining, clean the outlining, cleanup, and then another person painting in the colors. Uh, comic books essentially worked in that same format. So you have one person. Um, the penciler has a lot of the work because they're they're the major storyteller. They have to lay out the page, they have to design the page, they have to do most of the main acting. The inker is is the refiner. We're supposed to enhance the artwork. We're supposed to improve it, make it better, make it glossier, shinier, more textural, add blacks when necessary. Um, we're supposed to up the level a little bit. So basically, my job is to make the penciler look as good as they could possibly look if they had twice as much time to do it. Um, and because they really don't have twice as much time. They only have a month to do the product usually. Um, so by me taking on my own time span, I can put in extra effort and hopefully, again, my job is to enhance it. The colorist who comes after me, that's also their job is they're supposed to enhance what I give them. So literally it's three different artists usually working together to come up with a complete and product, and I liken it to what a uh, a music group does on stage. In the studio, if you have endless amount of time and energy, one person may able be able to write all the songs, sing all the lyrics, play every instrument. But on stage, you really need to have a whole bunch of people doing different things, working together, and frequently that group effort excels beyond what one person can do by themselves. So collaboration among artists is a way for us all to lift each other up and hopefully make the end product be a better end product. So when we, we talk about uh, certain inkers, we, we know like Joseph Rubenstein is known for inking the most characters when he was doing the Marvel handbook. Um, right. And he talked once about how he has to sort of fit the style of the pencils. And I would imagine that's something that you have to be aware of when you're working. Uh, yeah, not every inker works that way. Uh, my model at the outset was I actually started as a penciler before and inking my own work. And I had a, a kind of horrible experience where somebody else inked my pencils and I was horrified. I hated what they did with my work. And so I said, okay, if I want to become an inker, I want to give the penciler as much respect as I can of their style, not just impose my own style on top of whatever I get. And some inkers do that. Some of the top inkers actually do that of just do the same style over everybody. That's a choice. My choice was to become adaptable, and I've won actually many awards for being an adaptable inker uh, because I, I think style is, is kind of just a surface thing on top of good drawing ability. And once you know how to draw well, style is kind of an easy, at least for me, an easy thing to adjust to fit the particulars of an individual. I'm also um, kind of unusual in today's inking world in that I work equally well with a pen or a brush. And usually inkers are confined to they're a brush style inker or a pen style inker. And I kind of easily cross over both me, both categories. So let me ask you that. Uh, it's a great follow-up because um, if I'm looking at your work, I might not know that you're inking with a brush or a pen. So what are the advantages of working with one versus the other? Um, well, most of the classic inkers worked primarily with a brush. Uh, the main reason for that is a brush is faster. It actually dries fast. The ink dries faster on the page when you use a brush. Uh, but the downside of a brush is it tends to give a very kind of 
soft, fluid feeling to everything. And a pen gives you a kind of harder, sharper, cutting edge. So um, the image style of inking was primary, uh, which was basically modeled on Scott Williams. Um, he used primarily a pen. Now he actually uses a brush a lot as well, but he figured out a way like I did to make it look like you can't tell the difference between the two. So if you're really adept with the tools, you can blend them together very easily. Um, but some people just do one or the other. They, they're not because it takes a lot of practice, practice, practice on both tools to be a master of them. And if I were, uh, you know, looking at getting some basic inking tools, um, what would be some of the, the, the ones that I should look for? Because I, if I'm picking a brush, should I just get, you know, the brushes that I find at the art store for 99 cents? Or am I looking for something that's a little bit uh, more expensive and, and I don't know what to do with it? Yeah, uh, well, unfortunately, uh, if you're doing traditional inking like I still do, uh, the brush matters. The, the actual tool you use matters a lot. Even the quill pens that I use, the dip pens, uh, the pen points that are made nowadays actually are not as good as the pen points that were made 50 years ago. And interestingly enough, I actually use a whole lot, uh, the majority of my pen points are from a company that went out of business in the 1950s, but their quality was so good, I have a lifetime supply of Esterbrook pen points to use in my pens. Uh, because the quality is much, much higher and the metal is better. It's just really good equipment. Um, the same thing goes with brushes that normally um, I use Winsor Newton Series 7, uh, which are made from Kalinske Sable. Uh, very expensive. It's imported from Russia, but it retains, um, it holds liquids very well and retains a really, really fine, sharp point. And when you're inking, having control of that point to be the, – the wonderful thing about a brush is you can get as fine as one hair at the tip of the point or very, very thick with the same tool. And if you're not using a good brush, you can't get that quality of line. So having the skill is very important, but having good tools is also very important. And it's funny that now a lot of people are trying to do digital inking and the – inking programs are trying to replicate the traditional tools and they're, they're actually getting quite good at it now. I was going to ask you about that because, um, you know, you're in a medium where artists are increasingly moving towards the, the digital work uh, flow. I was talking to Marco Santucci recently who said he's doing pencils and inks basically at the same time because he's working on a tablet. So when you're working on someone else's pencils, are they working digitally and, and you're just able to, you know, print it out and, uh, and go over that? Or are they still actually working with the, the old pencil on board? Um, some of the, the old school guys like me, um, like whenever I work with uh, Mark Bagley or John Romita Jr., I usually get pencils from them. Um, but nowadays, it's so much easier and faster for me to get a digital file of the pencils instead of the actual board. Um, so the majority of the time now when I work for Marvel in DC, I get a digital file. I actually uh, transfer the pencil drawing into what we call blue line, a blue ink, or it could be a red ink or a green ink, any color I wish really. I print it out on traditional board and then I ink it by hand. The asset of that, and I also know um, several pencilers slash inkers still ink traditionally because the asset of having the traditional inks is that you have an original piece of paper, especially if you're doing things like covers or splash pages, you're literally throwing money away on the collector's market if you're doing it all digital. And not it's not like everything works that way, but like David Finch, when I worked with him, he prefers to give me the real pencils and I prefer to work over the real pencils. And a David Finch cover may be worth $10,000. And if he did it digitally and I did it digitally, we both would have thrown away $10,000 that we could have split between us. And that's kind of foolish if you think about it. So, and granted, most pages aren't worth that much money, uh, but it's still, it, it's really nice to be able to hold 
an original piece of art and touch an original piece of art as opposed to just have a file that anybody can access the same way. Now, you've talked about uh, having a relationship with certain pencilers, uh, whether it's Mark Bagley or John Romita Jr., or in the case of uh, Tom Lyle, someone that we know uh, pretty well on comic culture, uh, you've worked in sort of a collaborative partnership. And, you know, if you take a look at the inks of Joe Sinnott over Jack Kirby, you can see how that collaboration worked, because Kirby's work looked better, in my opinion, with Sinnott than with Mike Roy or No Knock on him. Um, so I'm wondering uh, how you develop these relationships with with various artists and how that that push and pull kind of works uh well every artist is obviously different um i luckily i bring a lot to the party that i know how to draw very well um, i love anatomy so one of the things i did with tom lyle is he has a really good storytelling sense and a, a kind of graphic style but his anatomy isn't perfect um so he allowed me to kind of adjust, you know, shoulders or rib cages occasionally if it would improve the image. Uh, some pencilers are very picky and they're like, no, no, I don't care if I did it wrong, just, you know, keep it the same way I had it. Whereas Tom was like, wait, it looks better when you do it. So, you know, keep doing what you're doing kind of thing. And it's great when you get a relationship with a partner like that, where you're both encouraging each other, uh, I, I'm also a teacher, so I am literally trying to teach my pencilers sometimes how to be better pencilers. And some pencilers are like, no, no, you can't do that. I, I'm, I'm the star. Whereas other, usually, weirdly enough, the better the penciler are, the more willing they usually are to take critiques. Um, the worse they are, the more sensitive they are, and the, you know, they, there are always exceptions. There are some newcomers that know they don't know everything and they want to get better really fast. Uh, but Tom was one of those guys. He, he had been around a little bit longer than I had, but he still knew that I was bringing something extra to the group and that together we came up with a, a better end product, which we were both happy with. And he was also um, one of those artists that, uh, in inking, there's something called finished pencils and inks and finishes. Most people in the industry, when they read finishes, they just think, oh, that's another name for inking. But finishes really means you're getting rougher pencils and the finisher is finishing the pencil artwork and inking it. And that's actually one of my strengths because I know how to draw so well. And Tom Lyle was one of those artists that was very happy to work with me in the breakdown finish aspect where he, again, he, his specialty was that story, that strong storytelling. So he would do the storytelling and let me do more of the rendering and be very happy with that uh, partnership. And uh, so we did that uh, frequently on Spider-Man. We did that even much later uh, on, on other projects, but it, I always love that you know, when you can really have trust in your other partner. Same thing happens when I'm working with one of my, you know, I, I have a few favorite colorists that as soon as I know I'm working with those colorists, I just like, it, it's a breath of relief and I know everything's going to be, you know, they're going to take every hint I give them and, and just run with it. And it's just a pleasure when you get that, when you know it's going to look even better at the next stage instead of worrying about, you know, what your partner is going to be doing. And it's interesting because in, in music, let's say, uh, if you put the right four people together, you get the Beatles. If you put the wrong four people together, you get um, any band that I've been in. So, <laughs> uh, I'm just wondering, when you're working on a book and everything starts to click between the penciler, the inker, and the colorist, um, is there a lot of communication that goes into that? Or is it just sort of that, you know, we're all playing the same song and we just managed to hit the groove the right way? Um, it's It's... Every group is a different family. Uh, so, like, Tom Lyle, I talked with all the time. Mark Bagley, I, I usually have back and forth with him on a regular basis. Uh, Tom Rainey, I have a lot of back and forth with. John Romita Jr., who I worked with, uh, you know, literally almost every month for a 10-year period, we almost never talked. It was kind of, he just was like, I do my job, you do your job, and we loved working together, but there wasn't a lot of communication going on um same thing with colorists on on rare occasions i'll have a lot of contact with the colorist but most of the time it's kind of like 
okay, I did my job, you do your job, and the editor just, you know, does all the communication. I've had instances where editors have told me not to talk to pencilers because they're like, okay, Scott, we don't want you influenced by this guy. We want you to do your thing and not be influenced by what he's telling you because we want you to change him. And then other editors are like, okay, no, you guys talk to each other and just ignore me. You know, so uh, one of my philosophies, and I hate to say this, but is I prefer to talk with the other artists rather than the editor. I'd rather be one-on-one -on -one with the penciler, with the colorist, even with the letterer. Uh, in the early days, one of my favorite letterers started using, um, we, we would communicate, we would see each other in the DC offices, and he found out that my wife has a different maiden name than I have. Her, her maiden name is Patak, P-T-A-K, um, which is an unusual name, and I was like, hey, you know, it would be really cool if when there's a, a, a machine gun sound, like or like, a, you know, a, how about instead of tick or you know patak uh, how about turn into patak and you know and and the letter was like sure i can do that and so in or i think it was a lot in hawk and dove uh he, we were working together and and he kept putting patak all over the place for sound effects just because we were you know it was it was an in-joke thing and a lot of artists do that and it's that's what makes it personal and fun and you can go back to it 20 years later and say oh yeah this is where that sound effect was put in just for me you know uh, but you can't do that if you don't communicate with your partners. Now, um, one of the things uh, when it comes to, to inking uh, pencils is you try and stay true, unless it is that, that breakdown, like you were saying, where you're doing a lot where the finish is. Um, and I, I guess I don't want to get into naming names because that, that's obviously wrong. But, uh, you know, I've heard stories throughout the years of, you know, a certain inker who was asked to ink a certain way and the penciler didn't like it. Um, I'm just wondering if in your career you've had any instances where, you know, the, the editor might be giving you that pressure to do something uh, one way, but you're trying to do it, uh, you know, the way that matches the pencils or something like that. Okay, that was actually Mark Bagley calling me. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, sometimes there, there are times where no matter how good the artists are separately, it's just not meshing. And the mindset isn't working. The I've got a different goal than the penciler has. And as I said before, sometimes the editor wants me to make those major changes, despite what the penciler likes. Um, and other times, I've had times where it just didn't work. Uh, I Again, I won't name a name, but there is one penciler. I really liked his work. I enjoyed working with him. Um, but when I saw his pencils, his, his pencils seemed to me very kind of slick and almost cartoony in a way. And he was actually looking to get his style changed to a sharper image type style. Now, I love doing an image type style when I'm working with an image type penciler. But to me, it just wasn't compatible for my personal sake to drastically change what I was getting. And... Whereas another anchor would automatically do that and kind of ignore what they got and just turn it into that style. And so we just didn't work together because I couldn't, even though I could do the style he wanted, I couldn't relate it to what I was being given and it just wasn't a perfect fit. Uh, and again, you know, I'm a good anchor. He's a good penciler. It just wasn't that proper match. Um, and then other times uh, it may be an editor is making that choice. Like, uh, I will name a name, David Finch, I was working with him on Wonder Woman, we were having a great relationship, and then he got transferred over to Batman, and the editor didn't want, and asked for me specifically, he told me so, and the editor didn't want me, and I, and they don't give you a reason, it's just, oh, he, so he was probably looking for a specific thing that he didn't see in the Wonder Woman project, not realizing also, some editors don't know that I'm as adaptable as I am. So if an editor tells me, oh, can you change it this way, I can do that. Uh, one of my favorite editors at DC is um, uh, Brian Cunningham, and he knows how adaptable I am. So he'll frequently ask me, oh, Scott, can you ink it this way as opposed to you know, this, another way? And I'm very happy to adapt and adjust myself to fit the circumstances of the project. 
Now, you, you said adaptable, and I'm wondering um, if you're uh, working in a style that's uh, not true to the pencils, is it difficult for you to stay focused for 20 pages? Uh, or do you, you know, occasionally find yourself saying, well, I'm going with the pencil here. I, I need to go back and make it look this, the way that the editor wants or the way that the penciler asked me to do it. Um, sometimes it gets tricky because I frequently work on three or four or more pencilers in any given month. So I'm changing styles literally from page to page if I'm changing books. Uh, so my preference is to work on one book in total, you know, for a set period and then go to the next. But in reality, it doesn't work that way. So if I've got three different editors all wanting pages from me, I have to do one page from one penciler, another page from another penciler, another page from another penciler. And that's when it starts getting tricky to make sure that those styles stay consistent with each project. Uh, and not because the easy way is just to do a standard thing. Um, but the harder way is to try to make sure it's consistent with what you've already established for the book. Uh, luckily, as, as I've gotten more mature as an artist, editors generally kind of leave me alone and say, Scott, we know what you can do. Just do whatever you want. And, and, and also, when I was starting out, working on three different styles was a little bit tricky sometimes. Now it's kind of like a no-brainer. It's automatic. I can do it without hardly even thinking about it. It's just my natural tendency. So um, let's, let's, you say you work on up to three books a month. And I'm wondering <laughs> yeah. how much time you're able to devote to a, a single issue. I mean, we're talking, uh, what, 20 pages an issue? That's 60 right. pages of comics that you're inking in essentially uh, four weeks. So how fast are you? Well, supposedly, and this is, some, we don't always keep really close records, and I haven't either, but supposedly I've inked more pages of comic books than anybody else in the history of American comics. Um, so I've, my, my low estimate, and I haven't kept an exact number, but my low estimate is I've inked a, a little over 22,000 pages of comics in my career so far. Um, and, <laughs> and I think Vinnie Collette is, is the, used to be the highest and he's inked about 21,000. But again, we don't know if he kept exact numbers either. And even mine is a low estimate. I've probably done closer to 23,000. Uh, but generally I can, my standard over most pencilers, I can ink uh, what I call three pages a day, but I work a long day. So that might be a 12 hour work day, which comes down to about four hours per page on a standard pencil. There are some pencilers that take me a little longer, some pencilers I can actually do even faster. Um, if it's a very uh, simple style, like uh, Ron Lim, I've worked with a lot, he's got a very um, open, kind of old-fashioned uh, comic style, kind of like Sal Buscema used to have, and he's very easy for me to ink because he doesn't have a lot of lines per square inch. Uh, if I work with uh, some other um, really complicated artists, um, it can take me, you know, one page may take me 12 hours, but that's rare. Um, but interestingly enough, I talk to other inkers and I'm like, oh yeah, this, uh, Fer Fernando Passerin is one of the most detailed pencilers I've ever worked with. We worked together on Green Lantern Corps. And it, in that book, if the writer said there were 100 Green Lanterns on the page, Fernando would draw 100 detailed little figures on the page. And so his pages took me a long time to ink. But I talked to every other inker who had worked on him, and they're like, yeah, one page would take me two days. I'm like, oh, I was doing two pages a day. So, And I don't know why I'm faster, but some, for some reason, I am faster than most. But I think a lot of it has to do with my drawing ability makes it easier for me to do the inking work fast. Um, and most, most of the best uh, inkers in the industry definitely – Actually, literally all of the best inkers have to know how to pencil. It's, it's a, you have to do it that way. Um, I, I've talked to people who are like, oh, I can't draw that well, so I'll become an inker. It's like, no, that, it doesn't work that way. It just, you can't do it that way. I'm sorry. Now, you've also, uh, in, in addition to doing uh, three books, uh, three pages a day of inking, you also are teaching uh, comics. And I was wondering, <laughs> yes. not only uh, do you sleep, but uh, if you could tell us a little bit about what you're doing in the few minutes that we have left. 
Okay. Um, actually, my wife and I started our own small little private school. Uh, both of us, uh, she had taught at several different art schools and colleges. She teaches fashion. At, we met in art school. And I've loved teaching uh, ever since I was quite young. Uh, my mother is an art teacher. I She used to teach art classes at home in painting. And I... I just love the idea of sharing the knowledge. And when I was going to teach at colleges or art schools, I realized it was a real drain on my time because I am a very busy person. I work full time for Marvel in DC. And just the time traveling to the schools, prepping for classes was really difficult to, to fit that into my hectic schedule. So my wife came up with the brilliant idea of, well, how about, we bring our students to you instead of you going to them. So essentially we started our own little school. Uh, for a while we actually had a storefront where we were teaching right in our local town. Uh, but then we made it even easier and we literally have our students come to our home studios. And um, so I literally teach out of my quite large home studio. I can have as many as 10 or 12 students in the class. Um, and But most of the time it's actually quite small because in the olden days, the way I learned how to do comics, and up up until probably the 1980s or 90s at least, the only way you got into comics was essentially you worked as an apprentice for another artist. And schools don't teach you the same as an apprenticeship does. Uh, I actually served two apprenticeships when I was getting started. I worked with a fantasy uh, comic book, or sorry, book cover painter. Um, so I, I did painting as an apprentice to a book cover painter, and then I became an apprentice to a comic book inker for a short period uh, as preparations to do what I do. So by teaching in my home studio, it's much more of a personal apprenticeship style learning where they see my real working environment. They see pages I'm actually working on while I'm working on them. They see all the tools, all my reference, all my setup. Um, I find that to be much better in art uh, as a way of teaching than just, oh, here you got an A, B, C, or D. I literally don't grade my students. It's all about just learning what you can learn. It's not about getting a grade, getting a transcript, uh, because in, in my experience, unless you want to become a teacher, in art, nobody has ever in 30 plus years of a professional career asked me what my grade point average was. You know, they never, and I went to a very good school, but nobody ever has ever asked me what school I went to, what grades I got. All they care about is what you can produce in art. And so your portfolio is what it really counts in the world of art, not what your grade point average was. And I hate to say that about, you know, colleges, but most colleges are more worried about what your grades are than what your production is. I've seen people who have graduated from art school and like, wait, I was better than that in high school. What did they teach you? Now, some schools are really good. Like Tom Lyle is actually one of my buddies and teaches at SCAD, and I know he's a very good teacher. I've seen some of the work from his students. So, again, the better schools have better teachers, and they're, they are going to teach you the right things, obviously. So, uh, Scott, unfortunately, we've run out of time. I, I do want to thank you so much for taking the time out today uh, to talk to us on comic culture. I'd like to thank you at home for watching. We will see you soon.